What an excellent day for an exorcism. The power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you! Do you believe in evil, Mr. Mash? Well, I know you. Get serious here, man. Do you believe that evil exists as a force? It would have to, right? With things like ISIS in the world. People can do despicable, horrible, disgusting things. Does it come from inside of us, or is it something else? There is a presence that is negative. Now, whether or not it's evil, I don't know. These are the deep thoughts that are inspired by the film franchise we're talking about today. Though, really, it's just one movie. Today, we're discussing what is considered by many, many people to be the greatest horror film the scariest horror film ever made, and that's 1973's The Exorcist. I happen to agree that it's possibly the scariest movie ever made. It's always a little presumptuous to say that any film is the greatest anything ever. Okay, yeah. but dude, this movie was literally so scary that it scared people back into church. It did. If you'd let me finish my sentence, I would have said, it's hard to say anything is the greatest anything ever, but The Exorcist is certainly one of the greatest, not just horror films ever made, but one of the greatest films ever made, I would say. Pretty damn good. There's that great original film, and then there are... Some sequels, which are of vastly varying quality. And then there are also some weird peripheral movies we're going to throw in to make this a little fuller of an episode. Jump right in with the original 1973 Exorcist, because I think it's an excellent day for an exorcism. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> Demi, why you do that to me, Demi? Uh, why you do this to me, Demi? Demi. Demi. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. <laughs> Nobody expected it. Nobody believed it. And nothing could stop it. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. The one hope. The only hope. The exorcist. When this movie came out, it was a true pop culture phenomenon of the sort that doesn't really exist anymore. It's not possible for one film to take a root in the culture. I guess Avatar was the last thing that came remotely close to that. The closest thing that we have to that nowadays is The Avengers. In the 70s, that was the birth of the blockbuster. The Exorcist. You had The Godfather. You had Jaws. You had Star, Star Wars. Wars. The great thing about The Exorcist is that it did spurn debate and discussion. It was condemned by many, many Christians for its content. Some people in the religious community supported the film. As you said, it made them go back to church. It made the devil real again for a jaded generation. If I would have seen this movie back in the time, if I would have seen that movie back then, I probably would have been like, oh shit, I need to get God in my life now. <laughs> I actually took the time to read the book this movie was based off of before I sat down to record this podcast. William Peter Blatty, who was primarily known for writing comedy, he wrote the Pink Panther movie A Shot in the Dark, was inspired by a supposedly true story of a boy that was possessed. It's the only time in modern America the Catholic Church has approved an exorcism. Reading the book and then watching the movie, Blatty was also a screenwriter, wrote the script for this film. In fact, he's in the movie. At the beginning, when Chris is on set and there's a guy talking to the director, that's William Peter Blatty. Because it was written by the guy who wrote the book, it's a really, really close adaptation. Nearly scene for scene. Some of the plot in as few as word possible, Mr. Mash. Girl plays a Ouija board. Girl gets possessed. All shit hits fan. <laughs> really old priest comes in to save the day. Dies. Really young priest who lost faith. Chokes the devil out of the girl and then <laughs> jumps out a window and refuses last rites. No, he does doesn't refuse. Father Dyer goes up to Harris and says, do you want confession? He answers by squeezing his hand. I remember the guy going up and saying, do you want your last rites? And he took his head. I assure you that the intention of the filmmakers was that Damien Harris finds peace with God in his final moments of life. To expand on JT's simplification a little, Chris McNeil is an actor. She's currently filming a movie in Georgetown, D.C. She has her 10-year-old daughter, Reagan. Some strange things begin to happen. There are some strange scratchings in the attic, though no rats. Reagan says her bed is shaking. Things slowly escalate. Science offers 
lots of help. Reagan just keeps getting worse until Chris McNeil's only option is to go to the church. Damien Karras brings in Father Marin, who has a history with the demon. Now, you mentioned the Ouija board. Do you think the Ouija board is what causes Hell Reagan yeah. to become possessed? Really? She was talking to Captain Howdy that she gets possessed. I think it's very much implied that it was the Ouija board. I think Reagan would have been possessed anyway. I don't think the Ouija board had anything to do with the demon coming into her. She reveals later on in the movie that she had been playing with her the whole time she had been in the house. It was a gateway to her getting possessed. Well, then you also reference Captain Howdy. Is Captain Howdy the demon? Captain Howdy is Reagan's imaginary friend. Is Captain Howdy the thing that's hurting her? She's under hypnosis. The shrink says, is there someone inside you, Reagan? And she goes, sometimes. Let me ask her, is it Captain Howdy? Do you believe that that is the demon? Well, you read the book, you tell me. Well, they don't answer the question. I'm torn on that. I can't remember if she said that she talks to Captain Howdy through the Ouija board. Yeah, she does say that. Okay, then yes. The scene where she tries to show her mom the Ouija board and it doesn't do anything. And right, she says, and she says, come on, Captain Howdy. That's not very nice. Yeah. We agree this is, if not the scariest movie ever made, then obviously one of the scariest movies ever. Well, it's definitely top ten. What do you think makes it work? Even though it's supernatural, it still has a lot of realism to it. Exactly. William Freakin is the guy who directed this movie, and it's almost a docu-drama. He creates an acute sense of reality. Obviously, the music, Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells, is very famous. There's very little music in the movie. Right. The only time you really hear that theme is when Chris is walking down the street, which is set on Halloween at that moment, by the way, because some trick-or-treaters run by her. I never noticed that before we watched it. I think I've movie. noticed that before. But generally speaking, there's very little music in the film. That creates this very chilly sense of unease. The opening scenes seem really normal. I was thinking about this in the shower this morning, how Chris McNeil's a big Hollywood actress. She's hanging out with astronauts and senators and stuff, but she still seems like a down-earth, normal human being. You never think that she's out of touch. We reference the scene where she's walking down the street, or when Father Karras is giving communion, and there's always a sense of creepiness. Even though things seem normal now, something very, very wrong is going to happen very soon. The scene of Karras' nightmare about his mother. There's nothing overtly sinister about the scene. He dreams that his mother's coming up out of a subway station. He's running over to talk to her. She descends back into the subway before he can get to her. The way it's odd is really mm. unnerving. Or when Reagan's in the hospital. Some people think the scenes of Reagan in the hospital having the surgeries performed on her are the scariest scenes in this movie. I've heard people say that that's the most disturbing thing to them. And I kind of get they put her head in this x-ray machine and there's this noise and you can hear her wincing and how awful this is for her. Well, maybe, but I think the scene that always creeped me out is the famous crucifix scene. Oh, let Jesus fuck you. Yes. R-rated podcast today. Get the kids out of the room. That's really the moment that makes Chris go to the church. Something is wrong. That part and where she twists her heads around oh, and yeah. says, did you say what's our hunting daughter did? Oh my god! So does pointed myself until reading the book I didn't get that that was the voice of Burke the director that Reagan may or may not kill Really? Yeah. That's what that's meant to be. Earlier in the film, you can hear Burke Dennings at the party. He uses the phrase hunting, which is not an especially common swear. A big part of the book is this guilt on Chris's half over whether or not Reagan killed Burke. Left ambiguous if she did it or if the demon did it. I've only seen the movie. I've never read the book, of course. Of course. I've always gotten the feeling that Reagan herself killed. Here's why. The the scene where she's talking to her mom and she says, you're going to marry Mr. Dennings? Yeah, maybe even the demon talked her into it. Obviously, the demon has some control of reality taking Reagan's bed and twisting her back and forth. Let's talk about some of the shocking scenes. Let me talk about the spider crawl. I want to get to that when we talk about the extended version because that's not in the original. Well, that's the version I've seen most recently. The scene with the crucifix. This movie was very, very shocking in 1973. I don't think it's because of the content. Were these things seen widely in mainstream films in 1973? Probably not. However, I think it's the way it shocked. The first half of this film creates a sense of realism Mm -hmm. which leaves us unprepared for the crazy shit that's going to happen. This 12-year-old girl bloodily stabbing herself in the genitals with the crucifix and yelling, let Jesus fuck you! Grabbing her mother's head and pushing it down into her crotch and saying, let me! I seem to remember that in that scene, the demon yells, let Jesus fuck you. Right. But then you also hear Reagan going, mother! Yeah, when Chris is downstairs, you hear Reagan in her regular voice scream, and then you hear the demonic voice say, do it! You can tell that's part of the demon trying to take over. The scene where she attacks her mother ends with the famous head spin, which Mm -hmm. has got to be one of the most iconic images in all cinema. Definitely. Cracking. Oh, God. Around. Yeah, that's still, oh, just thinking about it. The pea soup. You read about how they did it. It's really a simple effect. They hid the pipes underneath the makeup and they had it go in her mouth and curve back around. It still looks really realistic the way this stream, this fountain of green ooze comes out of her mouth. I think by rooting the film in reality, it makes these moments credible. Other than one or two parts of the movie, it never crosses that line into hardcore supernatural. You gotta think about people seeing this movie for the first time in 1973 who don't know that it's a movie about a demonic possession. There's always this question of, is is the supernatural or 
is Reagan just sick? Is she mentally ill? Except for the head spinning. The supernatural parts of it can all be factored in under emotional state. Up until the very end when she's levitating. By that point, you've accepted that this is supernatural. Something I think all of the actresses' ripoffs that followed really miss is that it's not the content that makes this film shocking. What makes them horrifying is that they're happening to this girl in this house in this way. Reagan is this cherub-faced, perfect little child. What do you think of that long opening sequence of Father Marin in Iraq? What do you think that means? They say he ran into this entity before. Before they get Father Marin, the priests say he performed an exorcism 20 years ago in Africa. Right. And that's all they say. That statue is the physical representation of the demon that he battled. Doesn't Reagan tell him that the name of the demon was Pazuzu? Pazuzu only happened in the sequel. Oh, that's... If you go to Wikipedia and you look up Pazuzu, it says that the demon is named Pazuzu. I take protest with that. The statue that Marin stands in front of, that is indeed a statue of the Sumerian wind demon Pazuzu. And there is one reference to Pazuzu in the book. In the very beginning, they find a small charm of Pazuzu. Otherwise, throughout the entire book and the first movie, the entity possessing Reagan is referred to only as the demon or the devil. And I don't think Freakin or Blatty's intention that the demon possessing Reagan is Pazuzu, ancient Sumerian wind god. You know what we forgot to mention? What? There's one scene in the movie where they're flicking on lights in the kitchen and the demon's face flashes up real quick. So the second or third yeah. scene in the movie, pretty early on. What do you think that gray face is that we see? Well, I've me- always felt that that was the entity that possesses Reagan. I sometimes think it's just in the movie to freak you out. Obviously, it's suggesting the presence of something evil. I don't know if that's literally what the demon looks like. Weirdly effective moment. If you blink, you miss it. Some of that stuff is in the original. It's more pronounced in the extended cut. It's a really simple makeup. Gray and black face paint, some teeth, yellow eyes, lenses, something unnerving about it. What I think the opening with Marin and Iraq, what that means, this is but one battle in a long, ongoing war between demonic forces and human faith. If you want to call it good and evil, you can. This is one small turnstile in a conflict that will extend forever from the beginning to the end. Three, four sequels. Well, yeah, but that last act when Marin gets to the house and the exorcism itself begins. Some of the finest horror filmmaking of all time. By that point, it is completely confirmed in the audience's mind that there is nothing going on here that is anything but supernatural. The thing that convinces Father Karras is when Help Me is written Mm -hmm. on Reagan's chest. Such a creepy moment. They refrigerated the set so you can see the breath of the actors. Reagan is levitating, the room is shaking. Didn't she almost get, like, hypothermic or something? Yeah, the actors were treated pretty roughly on this. The scene when Chris McNeil is knocked backwards, she was on a pulley that reportedly hurt her back. When Reagan is being thrashed about on her bed, Linda Blair reportedly has back problems to this day from that. The actors were treated pretty roughly on this set. The last third is still completely effective in what it sets out to do. Mm -hmm. Father Marin, he's so totally focused. He says to Karis, don't believe the demon, the demon lies. He gets a giant green blob spit in his face and he just calmly wipes his glasses off and keeps going with the exorcism. That conclusion, though, still triggers debate. You described what happened. Father Marin dies. He has poor health. Karis smacks the girl and says, Take me, damn it! When he throws himself out the window, has good triumphed? Is Damien Karis' crisis of faith resolved in his act of self-sacrifice? You know, it doesn't... Actually, I don't feel that way. Yeah, the ending doesn't really provide any concrete answers. This is a battle that evil has won. Reagan's soul was saved, but Karis is dead and committed suicide. The intention is that he repents... I mean, I think it's a forgiven suicide. Side. Certainly up for debate. Definitive conclusion on whether or not... Now, what do you feel? I like that it's ambiguous. I feel like it is meant to be a positive ending in one sense, in that the demon's been taken out of Reagan. You read Blatty's writing, you're going to talk a little bit about another movie he made that I think corroborates this. He believes that a human sacrificing themselves to save another is proof that a benevolent god exists. Though how good is it? Because you see Reagan still has the scars on her face in the last scene. This is going to haunt everybody forever. Let's just talk a little bit about the performances in this film. Ellen Bernstein as Chris McNeil is threadbare emotions. There's no actorly glamour here. You feel like she was really that exhausted. Well, she might have been the way the actors were treated on this. Possibly. Jason Miller as Harris is a great performance. What about Linda Blair, though? How much of the credible performance in this movie can be credited to her? When it's just her as a little kid, yeah, she's great. She's this innocent little child. Once Reagan is possessed, how much of that is Linda Blair and how much Mercedes McCambridge, famously uncredited, did the voice? Dick Smith's makeup obviously deserves a huge deal of the credit. She's still doing the facial acting. I feel like it was a collaboration of those three talents. One by itself, it wouldn't have worked. The combination of Linda Blair's presence, Mercedes McCambridge's voice, and Dick Smith's makeup together make one of the most credible film versions of demonic possession ever. It's so simple. It's not a really super elaborate makeup. At least it doesn't look like it. It doesn't do that god-awful stretched face-mouth thing. The 70s and 80s, back when special effects were subtle, you mean? Yes. <laughs> scared the shit out of you. Because it's totally plausible. Nothing they do to her makeup is impossible. 
It's all right. something that can happen. The reason this is a great movie is it discomforts us. It presents us with difficult questions. It tackles complex themes, real life issues about faith and guilt. Films that challenge us in this way are great movies. In 1999, The Exorcist was voted the scariest movie of all time. The most electrifying movie of the 20th century is now coming back to theaters. An expanded, thrilling new version of The Exorcist with footage that has never been seen before. Don't miss The Exorcist in the version you've never seen. Possessing theaters everywhere. In 2000, they re-released the film very famously. This was, I think, when I first saw it, and when a lot of people first saw it, advertised as The Exorcist, the version you've never seen, which is kind of an unwieldy title, mm -hmm. isn't it? But I just want to go down a list here of my comparison between the theatrical cut and the extended cut. It's pretty much the same movie. There's only one sequence that takes away from it. There are some additions that I like. Very famously, the spider walk sequence, where mm -hmm. Reagan comes down the stairs, and then vomits blood. Blood runs out of her mouth. Rather effectively disturbing special effect. Mm -hmm. There are some quieter moments I like. Marin and Karis take a break from the exorcism and talk on the stairs. Karis asks Father Marin, why this girl? That's straight out of the book, I can tell you. There are new scenes that I am indifferent to. Reagan freaking out in the doctor's office. Karis listening to Reagan's tape she made for her father. That's a brief scene. Karen, the tutor who we didn't talk about, when the exorcist is going on, she puts on headphones so she doesn't have to listen to it. And then the very last scene, and the original theatrical cut, it just ends with Father Dreyer walking away. And in the extended cut, he meets Kinderman, and they have a brief dialogue. There's only one scene, it's not even a scene, it's an element at it that I actually actively dislike, and that's when Reagan is being hypnotized, and before she grabs the shrink's balls and crushes them, in the theatrical cut she just does that. But in the extended version, you can see the demonic face on her for a second before she grabs the guy's balls, and I don't like that. By that point, there's still this question of, is she crazy? Is it supernatural? And by superimposing the demon face over her own face, I think it pushes it too far into the definite right. supernatural. I could agree with that. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same movie. The subliminal images have been talked about a lot, but I think their effect is overstated. Oh, and I like the sound mix in the original cut, though. The music is a little different. The sound mix is a little different. It's a little heavier. The original cut's a little spookier because it's more stark. But this isn't an essential director's cut. This isn't one of those director's cuts that completely changed the movie. It's not one of the director's cuts that is definitively better than the theatrical cut. Also, before moving on, do you remember seeing a version of this movie where the last scene of Chris and Reagan in the car is excised completely and it just ends after Karis goes out the window and has his moment with Father Dyer and it just cuts to black? That's the end of the movie. Do you remember seeing a version like that? Yeah, on TNT back in the day. Okay, so that's the edit for TNT. TV version. I guess so. Okay, because I remember seeing that. Okay, so I'm glad that I didn't just imagine that. I remember the first time I watched the version you had never seen. Because mm -hmm. the only time I'd ever seen the movie before was on TV. Your oh. mother darn socks and heck. Okay, so I'm glad I'm not the only one who remembers a version that ends right after Karis grows out the window. I kind of like that ending. I think that sort of works, truthfully. Kind of leaves it even more ambiguous. Yeah, ending. yeah. I kind of like that. Four years ago, The Exorcist shocked the world. Now... The struggle between good and evil goes on. It has become one of the most acclaimed and successful films in history. And now, Warner Brothers takes you a step beyond their minds locked together with the most terrifying vision of all. Obviously, massive theatrical success. And when a movie makes that kind of money, eventually somebody says, we got to make a sequel, guys. But how do you sequelize what is... De you know, generally considered the scariest movie ever made. Now, Exorcist Two: The Heretic was made by a director called John Borman, who had previously made Deliverance and Excalibur, both of which are good movies in my opinion. But he also made a movie called Zardox. I think, Zardoz. I think Zardox is a closer example to what Exorcist Two is than Deliverance or Excalibur. I've never seen the movie, but I've seen the trailer. You've seen Sean Connery in the pink loincloth. Yeah. Many people consider Exorcist Two: The Heretic the worst sequel ever made. Do you think it's the worst sequel ever made? Oh God, that's not fair. Surely there are worse sequels. What's the last Sniper movie Tom Berenger did? It's weird that they take the the out of sequel titles like that. It's not the Terminator 2. It's Terminator, Terminator. 2. Yeah. It's not the Exorcist 2. It's Exorcist 2. It's four years later. Reagan McNeil has grown into a teenager and she has no memories of what happened when she was possessed. But she also is developing psychic powers. A experimental psychologist named Dr. Tuskin is trying to get the memories out of her using a special hypnotism machine. Basically, they put on a thing on their head and they stare at a light bulb as it blinks faster and faster. And this allows them to share psychically the memories. Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, a man named Father Lamont, played by Richard Burton, is investigating the death of Father Marin, who the Catholic Church has said is a heretic. Father Marin said demons exist, can exert power over the world of God. Father Marin is a heretic. That's what the subtitle means. I just figured that out. Father Lamont's investigation takes him to Reagan, and together they explore Father Marin's past, the origins of the demon, and Reagan's destiny. A mistake Exorcist II the Heretic makes, which is a movie I don't particularly like. However, I don't think it's the worst sequel ever made. There are some things it does that are admirable and interesting, but I think the story in this movie is pretty bad. It does something that a lot of horror sequels do. It takes a very simple film and attempts to build an elaborate mythology around it. Now, we already mentioned the whole thing about Pazuzu, which I don't like. If you're going to give your demon a name, please make it a name that isn't as goofy as Pazuzu Demon. Pazuzu! I think... Pazuzu! (laughs) Identifying the demon tries to explain it, which robs it of its power. The thing I really, really hate is making Reagan special. She can heal sick people. She has psychic powers. She is a chosen one that can fight off evil. Part of the reason why the original is effective is that Reagan McNeil is just a normal little girl. It could happen to her, that means it could happen to anyone. Also, Reagan herself is not really that important. It's about the demon and Marin. Making Reagan significant really misses the point. And as I mentioned with the hypnotism and the psychic powers, this movie is knee-deep in 70s pop psychology pseudoscientific bullshit. I'm gonna run that by me one more time. 70s pop psychology pseudoscientific bullshit. Okay, now three times fast. <laughs> the original Exorcist feels timeless. It doesn't feel like a movie made in the 70s. Exorcist 2 really, really feels like a movie made in the 70s. Mm-hmm. It is immediately dated. I'm not saying this movie is without its pros. It does some interesting things. There's this extended flashback sequence to Marin in Africa, his first encounter with the demon. There are some striking images there. The sets are intentionally very artificial looking. Mm-hmm. Aerial shots flying over Ethiopia. Clouds of locusts. One of the weird things this movie does is associate the demon, Pazuzu if you must call it that, with locusts. Okay. Some of those sequences are very dreamlike in a good way. Particularly the moment where Father Lamont confronts the adult Pokemo, which is the boy. Do you remember the scene where Father Lamont stepped through the door and there's James Earl Jones with the locust headpiece on Mm -hmm. and he spits the tomato? Weird dreamlike sequence. John Borman, one of his talents, is making these very successfully surreal moments. Having said that, there's a lot of stupid, bad shit in this movie. I heard stopping the locust with dancing. Oh my god. Crash cut from Lamont in Africa having this very profound spiritual experience to Linda Blair tap dancing. The hypnotizing machine makes this silly noise and the sound design in this movie is irritating. Do you remember the music with the chanting and the screaming all throughout this movie? Yeah, Yeah. the music is bad. Well, I should say the sound design is bad. The score by Ennio Morricone is actually quite good. It's a lot of campy, silly stuff. I understand why people laugh this movie off the screen. Is Linda Blair a good actress? Specifically in this movie, but more broadly, just in general. When she's making fun of herself in a movie like Repossessed. (laughs) Which we'll get to. She is a good actress. Okay. Her range is exceedingly limited. Yes. (laughs) And she's bad in this. Yes. She has this super squeaky voice. You can't take her seriously at all. She has a nice rack. Uh... Richard Burton has been accused of going over the top, which I think is a very fair criticism. This whole movie, he's all blustery and sweaty. Pazuzu! Pazuzu! Koku boy! He stuffs every line of dialogue with unearned pretensions. Max Von Shadow and James Earl Jones get out with their dignity intact. How could you lose dignity if your name is Max Von Shadow? Yeah, really. The ending, the flashback, pseudo-memory of Reagan when she was possessed trying to seduce Richard Burton, and you have the locust coming through the wall, and the tutor, who's in this, steps on the glass and sets herself on fire. The last act of this movie is out of control. It is nuts. Where Reagan defeats the evil by dancing. Who thought that was a good idea? This is a deeply misconceived project made by a filmmaker who truly did not understand the original movie. However, at least the guy had a vision. John Borman was going for something. I do admire that. I don't think he was successful. But unfortunately, what were you going to do making a sequel to The Exorcist? There was no way you were going to top it. So give the guy some credit. At least he didn't go out and just make a ripoff of the first one. He did something different. Right. It wasn't good, but he tried. In 1973, an extraordinary motion picture stunned our senses and uncovered our deepest fears in a way no film had ever done before. When it was over, we thought the terror had ended, but it had just begun. You believe in possession, Father? Come to take a little blood from your father. The boy had been crucified. Killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes and cut off his head. Who are you? I am the one. He is inside with us. This time you're going to lose. 
people think of Exorcist 2 as a huge bomb. It actually made back its budget. It was successful. But the reception was bad enough that nobody touched this property for about a decade. William Peter Blatty, the original screenwriter, original writer, had an idea. And he wrote that idea down in a book called Legion. That book was successful. And Hollywood being what it is, that The Exorcist, that movie made us a lot of money. Let's make a new one. Let's base it off of this book William Freakin, the original director, was considered to direct. So it was John Carpenter. And John Carpenter almost made a movie out of Legion, but he said to William Peter Blatty, it's obvious that you want to do this yourself. And indeed, that's what happened. That movie Legion became The Exorcist 3, which came out in 1990. It had a very troubled production and mediocre box office, but it has developed a cult following over the years. We'll make the case that Exorcist 3 is the best sequel to The Exorcist. Maybe the only good sequel to The Exorcist. What's Exorcist 3 about, J.D.? Do you remember? This is a cop trying to figure out what happened or something. It's 15 years later, after the events of the first movie. We're back in Georgetown. Grotesque religious murders are taking place. Lieutenant Kinderman from the first movie, he's still haunted by the death of Harris. There's a little bit of a retcon here. In the movie and the book, Kinderman and Karras only meet each other a few times. But in this movie, Kinderman says Damien Karras was his best friend. He's still haunted by the death of his friend. These very strange murders are happening, and they are reminiscent of murders by a serial killer called the Gemini that was executed 15 years ago. Kinderman's investigation takes him to a mental hospital where he meets a man who has the same face as Damien Karras, claims to be the Gemini killer, and speaks of demonic masters from beyond. It's a murder mystery, sort of. This movie doesn't go for shock value. It's more interested in creating unease and a creepy sense of dread. There are some extraordinary sequences in Exorcist 3. The opening nightmare scene is very strange and dreamlike when the doors of the church blow open and the eyes open on the crucifix. I do remember that. Kinderman is left alone in a church and it gets very dark and there are some scenes you could call jump scares, but I don't think they're unearned. There are moments that build up toward something. Maybe the most famous scene in this movie is the nurse at the nurse's station. It's a long shot, a held shot at the end of this very long sequence. You see a figure dressed in a white robe emerge from behind a window with a giant pair of surgical scissors for removing limbs. You remember that scene, right? Yeah. That's the most famous scene in the movie. Or the old lady crawling across the ceiling. I don't remember. Exorcist 3 is overall a very uh, disciplined, mature, well-executed horror film. One of the reasons I like this movie so much is George C. Scott, who I love. George C. Scott is one of my favorite actors because he's always so angry and everything. He's, and he's so grouchy in all of his movies, no matter what it is. The actor who played Kinderman in the original movie, Lee J. Cobb, had passed away. They had to recast the part. The character in this film is very, very different. Oh, uh, yeah, probably. Dorothy Scott has these two incredible monologues, the first of which he sees a movie with Father Dyer, and their mutual favorite movie is It's a Wonderful Life. And after seeing the film, he tells Father Dyer about how his wife likes to make cod. She says she can't buy it from the store already dead because it affects the flavor. So he hasn't been able to take a shower for the last couple days because there is a cod swimming around in his bathtub. It's a very strange moment, and it's very much a William Peter Blatty piece of dialogue. Does that have some sort of deeper meaning? I don't know. Okay. I never made it to the end on this movie okay. because, quite frankly, dude, the movie's boring. With the exception of one of these films, all the Exorcist films are very slow paced, and I think it's intentional, and I think it's a strength of the series. You're wrong. At the end of the film, Kinderman goes to confront the man in cell 31. He gives this extraordinary monologue of the demon and asks him, Do you believe in me now? And very much in Dorchie Scott style, he yells, he's spitting, and he says, I believe in slime, I believe in murder, I believe in hate, and yes, I believe in you. A lot of the film is devoted to who they call Patient X, the man in cell 31. And he's played by two actors in this, which is a really interesting move. Sometimes he's played by Jason Miller. The movie reveals the spirit of the Gemini killer is inside the body of Damien Karras. The film cuts between Jason Miller and Brad Dorff, who very much gives a typical Brad Dorff performance. Man, that guy does crazy like nobody else. <laughs> he's always covered in a fine layer of sweat. And he's always shaking. He's in such rage. Very, very intense. Seems genuinely crazy. He's a good actor, that guy. Such an interesting decision to cut between the two actors. The point the movie is making is the title of the uh, book is a legion. The spirit of the killer can pass through bodies in this one. Much like The Exorcist, it deals with faith. It deals with guilt. The part I'm confused on. Okay. Do they explain how Paris is still alive? At the beginning of the film, that is when Paris's body wakes up for the first time in 15 years. The Gemini killer explains it's taken that long to make the brain cells work again. He's basically been in a coma for the last 15 years. Ah, uh, okay. So this is on behalf of the demon from the first movie. We put the Gemini killer in Karis's body to punish Karis. We wanted to see him suffer for driving us out. Originally, this was an even more low-key film. I know you think this movie's too slow now, so it was actually even slower originally. Morgan Creek, the producers of the film, wanted some reshoots, and they said, this movie's called Exorcist 3, it needs an exorcism. They introduced this really awkward subplot about a priest who goes and tries to exorcise Father Karis. It doesn't really take anything away from the movie, but it doesn't really add a lot anyway. Obviously a reshoot. Though you'll be happy to know, the priest in that scene is played by Nicole Williams, who played Merlin in Excalibur. So there's another connection. I think I knew that, actually. Yeah. I think Exodus 3 is actually a really effective movie. I really like it a lot. I mean, I'll give it another try, but the past three times when I have watched it, I have literally 
really falling asleep. It's slow paced. I don't mind slow paced horror when it's good. Father Marin. How do you know my name? I was sent here to search for the origin of a powerful evil. This place, it's cursed. You ever seen anything like it? It's a church. Churches were built to exalt heaven. But this, the weapons are pointing downward. They made a shitty prequel. The story of the Exorcist prequel is a really odd, elaborate, confusing tale, and I'll summarize it the best I can. They wanted to make a prequel to the Exorcist. This was early 2000s. Back then, prequels were still a hot idea. A prequel about Father Marin's first encounter with the demon in Africa. That is a genuinely interesting idea. And not that they would top the Exorcist. Well, but, yeah, there's no way to do that. But there still would be that chance to revisit a lot of the same elements. We touch a little upon that in The Heretic, but people debate whether or not that movie's canon. So it's a good idea. However, the production was best described as a clusterfuck. The original director, John Frankenheimer, died before the movie went into production. Oh, it's cursed. Yeah. And then they brought in Paul Schrader, screenwriter of Taxi Driver and The Last Temptation of Christ, to make a movie. And Morgan Creek said, this is too slow paced, this is too uncommercial, it needs to be gorier. Brought in Rennie Harlan, director of Die Hard 2, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Long Kiss Goodnight, stuff like this. He reshot the entire movie. That was the version that was released in theaters as Exorcist The Beginning. This movie is an excretal piece of garbage. This movie made me angry. It was so bad. What do you think of Exorcist The Beginning? All that plus it's forgetful. In the war, Father Marin taught some Nazi atrocities. This made him lose his faith. So now he's working as an archaeologist. He's sent to Africa where they discover a church that was buried underground. Wait, don't they make him kill somebody? Yeah, that's what the Nazis do. They say, you have to pick the ones that are going to die. And he refuses to do it initially, but in this cut, essentially make him do that. So anyway, they find a church. The inside of the church is exquisitely preserved Preserved, but there's some creepy desecrations in there. And then shit begins to happen. A boy becomes possessed. The local African natives and the British army are slowly working towards killing each other. I don't think the plot in this movie makes a lot of sense. The church plot goes wildly awry because the movie just temperamentally forgets about it. The church believes this is the spot where Satan fell to earth. And they don't really follow up on that. There was a massacre a hundred years ago that occurred on the spot and there was a cover-up. None of this has much to do with the mythology of the exorcist. And this is just a shitty horror movie. Is this the one where he's in the cave with the woman at the end? Yes. This movie is... So a lot of annoying jump scares. The gore in this is so over the top, and there's a lot of crappy CGI gore. This demon, when they open a drawer in the original, and they say, much to display. A vulgar display. That, that goes completely out the window here. Yeah, the boy's laying in bed, and he's using telekinesis to crack limbs and yeah, exactly. kill hyenas. Oh, yeah, the CGI hyenas. Oh, man, the CGI there is bad. Even in 2005, nobody thought that looked good. The stuff that happened in the original was vulgar in a way that was intentionally challenging you. This is grossick violence for the sake of grossick violence, and I hate it. It's the worst way to use gore in a horror film. There's a stupid plot twist. Throughout the movie, you think this little African boy is possessed. Oops, no, it's not him. It's Marin's love interest. Red hair tits McGee. <laughs> leads to this battle between Father Marin and the possessed woman in the underground church. And this is when the movie says, okay, remember the things people liked about the first exorcist? Do that. So she's got the green skin, she's got the scars, she talks in a voice that kind of sounds like Linda Blair or Mercedes McCambridge, I should say. And she's contorting her body and vomiting. And this is how stupid this movie is. When Father Marin drives the demon out of the woman's body using the exorcist ritual, he literally shoots bolts of energy out of his hands and it hits the woman. Her body flies around. Oh my god, it's dumb. This thing has had the potential to show us what would have happened if Reagan was untied. Fucked it up. Oh, I know. It's, just, it's like everything that's wrong with studio-made horror films, this movie. Oh, God, it's even worse than that. This bitch is going to be running free. <laughs> And then it's like, we get stupid cracky ghosts. I hate the cracky ghosts. I hate the cracky ghosts, too. No. It's fine in The Grudge. I don't want it in my Exorcist movie. Exactly. I don't want to hear... The shaky demon face. <laughs> oh, I fucking hate that. Jacob's Ladder, good film, but that movie is to blame for the shaky demon face. Every other horror movie from then on has done it. So anyway, oh, what do you think of Stalin Skarsgård, though? He's trying to act. I don't think the script is giving him much opportunity, but he's trying in this. I think he's the least problem in... Oh, yeah, for sure. The Exorcist was a horror film for adults, dealing with very serious, complex issues. And Exodus the Beginning is a horror movie for stupid teenagers. Director Paul Schrader brings us his vision of the devil's first battle with the exorcist. What idol could inspire a place like this? Lucifer. I will destroy the work of Satan. It's the work of man! Demonic Fury had a beginning. Satan is real. Dominion, prequel to The Exorcist. You're a weak vessel. Repel, Lord! The power of... 
after Exorcist the Beginning was unleashed to very poor reviews and public indifference, Morgan Creek figured they might as well release the Paul Schreider original cut, which was given the unwieldy title of Dominion, the prequel to The Exorcist. Now, I personally think this version is really quite good, and it's a completely different movie. They follow very similar plot outlines. Father Marin has lost faith, goes to Africa, finds a church. The British army and the local African tribes are very close to coming into a conflict. But other than that, the plots are very different. In this film, Marin finds a crippled child on the street who appears to be suffering from some sort of condition. And after the church is discovered, the boy's health begins to improve. And it's almost as if it's a miracle. He's being healed, but it's not a miracle. He's actually possessed. In the beginning, this underground church radiates this cloud of evil that make people do bad things, which is dumb. In this movie, the British army and the African tribes coming into a conflict together is an issue of imperialism and religious difference. When the British army first get there, the first thing they do is they shoot an African woman. Now the locals associate Christianity with murder. Escalates from there. It's much more realistic instead of an amorphous cloud making people commit murder. The thing that really fascinates me about Dominion, at the end, during the exorcism, the demon says to Father Marin, I can take your guilt away. In this version, what happened is he tried to stop the Nazis from killing innocent people and then happened anyway. And he has to live with this guilt. What the cost of faith is the burden of guilt. The easy thing is not feeling bad about stuff. The evil is not evil, it's apathy. And in order to be a good human being, you have to carry your mistakes with you. The boy, when he's possessed, becoming physically better is a visual metaphor for that, for how carrying the cost of our lives and our mistakes with us makes us better human beings. For a fucking prequel to a 30-year-old horror movie, that's actually a really profound mm -hmm. statement. And I admire the movie for going there. Do you understand why the studio said this was uncommercial? This really isn't even a horror movie. It's not scary at all. There's no pea suit. There's no profanity. The only real callback to the first movie is you see the Captain Howdy face or the demon face, whatever you want to call it, twice. You see it in a dream sequence. Boy is possessed. He flashes the uh, Captain Howdy face once. It's not a big special effects movie. And it is very, very slow paced. And the CGI hyenas are in this too, and it's unfortunate. But overall, I think Dominion is an intelligent, thoughtful film, and it's a worthy continuation of The Exorcist. If this had been released instead of the Rennie Harlan version, I don't think it would have made any more money, but I think at least it wouldn't have been a bane on the earth. <laughs> in order for life to have appeared spontaneously on Earth, there first had to be hundreds of millions of protein molecules of the ninth configuration. But given the size of the planet Earth, do you know how long it would take for just one of these protein molecules to appear? 10 to the 243rd power, billions of years. And I find that far, far more fantastic than simply believing in a God. So that's the end of the official Exorcist series. But there are a few miscellaneous movies I just want to talk about, and you have seen at least two of these. And the first of which is a really odd film, and its connection to The Exorcist is vague. William Peter Blatty made another movie. In 1980, he made a movie alternatively known as The Ninth Configuration or Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane, and this is also based on a book he wrote. And its connection to The Exorcist is, remember the party, Chris Froze? There's an astronaut there. That astronaut is a character in this movie. That character's name is Billy Cutjaw. <laughs> Cutjaw. <laughs> Sorry. <Right. laughs> this is why we only get two episodes out a month. It has to be stated that the ninth configuration is not a horror movie. Not even a little bit. I would describe it as half absurdist comedy and half existential thriller. And it's a very, very strange film. Let me ask you something because they kind of leave it ambiguous. We're using that word a lot tonight. Are the crazies in this movie actually crazy? We don't know! That's part of the plot. I think the only crazy one is Kane. The plot of the ninth configuration is after the Vietnam War, a cast in the Pacific Northwest has been turned into an insane asylum for Vietnam veterans who are having mental problems. And part of what they're doing there is trying to figure out whether or not they're actually insane. Bill, the astronaut, is there because before getting on the rocket, he had a mental breakdown. And they bring in a new doctor called Vincent Kane. Bill and Kane argue about the nature of humanity. They argue about whether or not good exists, whether or not evil exists, whether or not God exists. And they call God foot. Yeah, there's a lot of weird dialogue in this movie. In the second half of the film, we realize that Dr. Kane is a rather disturbed individual himself. 
himself. Hopefully, maybe you can explain it to me. There's a scene. I'll try. <laughs> after he cuts the head off. Okay. His discharge officer or whatever. These papers say that you're a psychiatrist or something. I'm sorry about that, sir. This must be for another Colonel Kane. Papers really weren't meant for him. They were meant for another Colonel Kane. There is no other Colonel Kane. What was in fuck you? <laughs> Why in Vietnam? Kane committed some horrible things. He cut off a little boy's head. In order to cope with that, he created a dissociative personality. That wasn't me that did these horrible things. It was another Kane. And they've created this elaborate scenario with him coming to the hospital, pretending to be the new shrink in hopes of bringing him out of the shell. Big spoilers there. Sorry, I just ruined the movie for you. And yeah, it isn't really clear. I have to read the Wikipedia synopsis afterwards to really get that. William Peter Blatty says this movie is a comedy. I mean, I can see that. I laughed at it more than I was anything else. Many absurd things happen. One of the inmates who's played by Jason Miller, this morning he said, man, Demi's in that movie. <laughs> and his character is putting on a production of Hamlet with dogs. And this actually takes up a lot of screen time. <laughs> I actually kind of want to see that movie. Shakespeare of dogs. There's an inmate who thinks he's Superman. He wears an N on his chest. Yeah. And I'm, is that racist? I don't know, because the man is black. I don't know what they're getting at. Are they going inward, man? Uh, I mean... Yeah, I'm not exploring that. And then there's a sequence where a guy's on a jetpack. What the fuck am I watching? It's not funny, haha. It's funny... Uh. It is a comedy in the sense that things that are intentionally absurd happen. But he's trying to get to counsel, and he keeps sitting with that bag of Fritos. Yes. Making that noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I didn't know this was a William Peter Blatty movie, I probably could have figured it out, because a lot of the dialogue is very obviously Blatty you know, dialogue. I was watching this movie, and I was like, this is totally a William Peter Blatty. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. You're making fun of me. That's the first half of the movie. And the second half is completely different. It is this very dark psychological thriller. And it comes when we have the realization that Cain is not who he says he is or not who he thinks he is. Dream sequence he has where he sees Jesus crucified on the moon. Yeah, and then he wakes up and says it wasn't my dream. Yeah, he's the astronaut's dreams. Okay, I don't really know what that means. Bill, the astronaut, leaves the hospital and goes to a bar. And there are a group of cartoonish bikers. They look like scene kids. They do. And they start to torture Bill in vaguely homoerotic ways. Kane shows up, tries to talk him out of it. They do some shit to him too and he snaps and kills them all. Almost Chuck Norris-esque bar fight where he's breaking people's arms and throwing people through windows and smashing their heads in walls. It's really intense and what the fuck happened to the goofy movie? <laughs> William Peter Blatty has said this is the real Exorcist 2 which I think is an extremely misleading thing to say. The thing that really connects us to the Exorcist other than the astronaut being a minor character in one movie and a major character in this one. Both movies deal with the idea of sacrifice. Selfless act of sacrifice. Cain believes that God exists and the proof is that human beings can sacrifice themselves to save other people. This movie is the key to figuring out good does succeed in the first Exorcist. Both movies, an act of sacrifice is what resolves the story. That's the real connection between the two films. I know this movie didn't do it for you and I didn't really like it. The fact that we're talking about it so much says that it is a really interesting film. There are people out there that would appreciate this film. I am not one of them. Am I glad that I saw the movie? Sure. Is it one I'm going to run out and buy? No, no. I, I don't think I'll ever feel the need to rewatch this one. But I'm glad I saw it because it is a genuinely weird movie. Got a great cast. Stacey Keach, Scott Wilson, Jason Miller. Tom Atkins is in this movie, man. Yeah, I meant to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, did you notice that there was a mustacheless Tom Atkins? Yeah, you don't recognize him immediately. Is this like one of his first movies? Early in his career. Though. He's been acting for a long time. Can't say that Blatty wasn't getting at something. In 1973... An entire world watched as a little girl and a holy exorcist battled and cast out the devil himself. I think Nancy has been repossessed. This is the only man who could possibly save her. Same year The Exorcist 3 came out, they also made a parody of The Exorcist called Repossessed. Leslie Nielsen in it, and the only reason we're really talking about it, it has Linda Blair in it as well. She sort of reprises her role. The character's called Nancy Aglet instead of Reagan McNeil, but she's the little girl that was possessed back in the 70s. She's playing the same character, essentially. You know they were poking fun at President Reagan, right? His wife, Nancy Reagan. Oh, I totally get it! Yeah, Nancy Reagan, ah uh, ha ha. That's a really subtle joke for a movie that is otherwise wise, not subtle at all. The jokes in it are mostly silly and lame. But the bar has been set so low for parody films that the fact that this movie actually has jokes in it and not just references to other movies actually makes it a better parody than date movie and epic movie and all the shit that's out there now. We can thank Scary Movie for that. Anyhow, repossessed. Everybody in this movie seems really, really embarrassed to be in it, except for Leslie Nielsen, who was a completely shameless actor. I read an interview once where somebody said Leslie Nielsen is the bravest actor in Hollywood because he has absolutely 
no shame. I feel like that's a true statement. Absolutely it is. The man would do anything for a laugh. And he does do many totally ridiculous things in this. Linda Blair doesn't seem too embarrassed, but I think she needed the money. Yeah, but she's not that bad either. She's better in this than she is in Exorcist too. Silly, funny jokes in this. There's a moment where they're performing the Exorcist and you hear her yell, Lick me! And they pan down and she's dressed like a giant ice cream cone. Ha 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 ha. Oh, I like it when she goes, You want to see what kind of power I have? I, I can, can make, make the, the film, film break. break. This movie is very, very meta. Characters are constantly talking to the audience and looking at the camera. There's lots of winking. Subplot making fun of televangelists. Yeah. This woman carries a pink poodle with her everywhere. She goes into a closet and she has dogs hanging on a coat rack and she just picks out a different dog. And I like it when they kill the poodle. When the poodle goes in the wood chipper. That made Bye, me laugh. Bye, foo-foo. Bye, foo-foo. That made me laugh. Yeah. It was stupid as hell, but it made me laugh. Reagan, not Reagan, Nancy, goes to the hospital and the doctor says, well, it could have been the flu. I had a couple cases around here recently. In the back, you see a guy carrying boxes that have the word flu written across them. That's the level of humor. It's a really silly film. I don't recommend searching it out. If I was going through the $5 bin and it was in one of those four packs of... All right. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah, you're right. I would. Now, this whole matter must be kept confidential. We're trying to bring the church into the 20th century. I can't approve of a medieval relic like an exorcism. I'm terrified of my own child. Please help me, God. Santa Maria, ora pro Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. One other movie that I just want to mention briefly. In the year 2000 when they re-released The Exorcist, not coincidentally, Showtime presented an original movie called Possessed. Just talking about repossessed, now we're talking about possessed. And this film claims to be based on the true story that inspired The Exorcist. This is a movie based on a story that inspired another movie. <laughs> and I don't know why, for some reason, this movie always stuck in my brain. And I remember reading some good reviews of it at the time. I went into this thinking, oh, this is going to be good. Unfortunately, it really isn't. It's set in the 50s. Robbie's the name of the boy. He begins to act erratically. He's using profanities, misbehaving at school, and he can move things with his mind. Parents go to the church, and Father Bowden, who is a priest having a crisis of faith. Is there any priest in pop culture who isn't having a crisis of faith? He eventually gets permission to perform an exorcism on the boy. This movie just goes to the hackiest horror cliches. There's a creepy ventriloquist dummy, dark and stormy night. The little boy in this is redheaded with freckles and little beady eyes. He is the stereotypical ginger, if we must use that word. And he's not scary at all. And the movie attempts to recreate a lot of the famous stuff from The Exorcist, grabbing the guy by the balls and the vomiting. It's really cheesy. Timothy Dalton, Christopher Plummer, Hyper Laurie, these are big names for a TV movie, but I think they were all just cashing a paycheck. Also, this was directed by the same guy who made Street Fighter the movie. I think he should have stuck with Jean-Claude Van Damme. We should have gotten a better film. Oh my god, like The Exorcist characters, but put them in the... Van Damme jump-kicking Linda Blair through the window. Exactly! <laughs> <laughs> One last thing about Possessed. During The Exorcism, Timothy Dalton says, buckle up, Satan, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Tim, did you need the paycheck that badly. You were James Bond, for fuck's sakes. And <laughs> two movies that people hate. I mean, I, I like this movie. I think Timothy Dalton was a great James Bond, and I think The Living Daylights and License to Kill are very underrated. Anyway. They are. There have been rumors over the years that they might try and remake The Exorcist. No. Which is, of course, a fallacious, no. ridiculous idea. <laughs> a couple years ago, it was announced that they were developing a TV miniseries version of the original book. The guy who directed Marcy Marfa May Marlene, I like that movie, is reportedly a I haven't heard any news on this in a long time. Do you think that is a good idea? Like a six-hour miniseries version of The Exorcist. Cut what I just said and post that. It doesn't matter what you do. Even if it's good, nobody's going to give a shit because the original is so iconic. I don't think The Exorcist is a story that needs to be told over four, or six, twelve hours. Let me paraphrase Robert England. Okay. The reason that The Exorcist does not need a remake mm -hmm. is because it's still effective. It's still relevant. It's a silly thing to do. There's absolutely no need to do it. If they want to continue to milk this for money, why not just re-release the original again? Or at least make a new movie. I don't think a new sequel or prequel or whatever is a good idea. If the people who own the rights want to keep milking it, do that. Well then, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Carras. And I'm the devil. Now kindly undo these straps. If you're the devil, why not make the straps disappear? That's much too vulgar display of power, Carris. If you feel possessed to send us an email, bangersandmash88 at yahoo.com. That Tremors episode, we can't keep it on the shelves. It's just the biggest hit ever. I'm kidding. It's not. It's the opposite of those things. I like those movies. I love those movies. Yeah. I bought them on blue for crying out loud. Yeah. How do they look on blue? Amazing. You can really make out the details in Kevin Bacon's face. Right. We have the Facebook group. There's been a little smidge of activity on there recently. As always, thanks to everybody. You know who you are at this point. But thank you very, very much. Speaking of James Bond, currently at my blog, www.zaxfilmthought.com. 
thoughts.blogspot.com. I am doing a retrospective of the James Bond series if you're interested in that. And hey, my book, Last of the Monster Kids, is now available at the very, very low price of $5. Please buy it. You have anything else to say, man? Have we yelled the devil out of this topic? Well, I think that we need to go... God damn it. Where's the phone number for the Vatican?